tonight. Thank you. Well, the drama, the tension and the waiting all ended peacefully last week. The event that's monopolised the public's attention for the last few weeks with excessive press and TV coverage. You know, the diehards, starved of sleep, kept awake night after night, refusing to come out. Well, it was all finally brought to an end when riot police stormed the crucible and ended the World Snooker Championship. <laughs> and of course, after last week's Commons ruling on embryo research, surgeons throughout the country are going to work on an egg. <laughs> Meanwhile, over in the White House, of course, George Bush is refusing to be rushed into anything. <laughs> well, it is very reassuring for the future of the planet. But what happens if there's a fire? Okay, guys, let's not panic, okay? Let's get around the table with the flames and thrash this out together. <laughs> Back home, of course, the government had a difficult run-up to the local elections, with all the polls against them. It's getting to the stage where, in tests, nine out of ten cats said they'd prefer a Labour government. <laughs> The other one said it'd rather be neutered, so it could join them. <laughs> Still, if all else fails, the Prime Minister can always resort to the time-honoured remedy for right-wing leaders fed up with the polls. Wait till Sunday, then invade Warsaw. <laughs> it's a far cry from the time a year ago when the entire party could put themselves behind Nigel Lawson and still not be seen from the front. <laughs> well, hello, good afternoon, and welcome to the world in interview. <laughs> it's amazing, Brian Wall, and if you look at one of his speeches, it's full of stuff like... Now, let me just rephrase that idea and make it sound like mine. <laughs> well, my guest in the studio is the Right Honourable Michael Heseltine. <laughs> Mr. Heseltine, good afternoon. <laughs> ah, well, let me stop you there. You said hello. Not good afternoon or good day, but hello. Very interesting. <laughs> now, let me just get one thing perfectly confused. <laughs> are you, or are you not, angling for the party leadership? Well, Brian, I'm prepared to put myself fully behind Mrs. Thatcher, whose leadership has been rigorous, resolute, radical, and inspirational. She will continue to show the way forward and to the victory at the next election. Ah, well, that's fair enough. So what you're saying is, you'd like to see her shot and burnt. <laughs> to begin. All right, okay, so what about South Africa? Well, with South Africa, we need to give them less stick and more carrot. Why me? I don't want to go there. Wait, what gets me right is they say in South Africa sport and politics don't mix. So if Nelson Mandela comes over here, where's the first place he goes? Wembley bloody stadium. <laughs> Why does he go there? I mean, they're always saying the English forwards are never given enough room to move. It's not bloody surprising there's 40,000 anti-apartheid protesters invading the pitch. I wouldn't mind, but I had it down as a home win. <laughs> I'm surprised he didn't have a commentary from John Mutson. It's what actually just about to say, uh, they did. So here we are, ten months away from the long road to Wembley, only to discover the game's at Tranmere Rovers. <laughs> play this kind of game, I have to say, Jasper, you have to pack the defence and play the old-fashioned formation of 4 2 47,000. <laughs> the rest looking at his watch, and if anyone can score now, my name's Franz Beckenbauer. Oh, my word, there's a goal, so this is me, Franz Beckenbauer, <laughs> handing you now back to the studio, where they're still struggling under six feet of snow. That's absolutely right, here it is, this is Peter Snow, things are hotting up, we won't get too slushy. There it is then, very, very much, as we predicted, the result, a complete and total surprise, but it's only a game, that's all it is, and if this result were repeated all over the country, there'd be nowhere to sit. Thank you. <laughs> I mean, these, these prison riots are terrible, aren't they? Oh, yeah, I was yeah. terrible, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Well, it, it's, it's overcrowded, isn't it? Oh. I mean, because you see, they send people to prison for anything, aren't oh, they? I mean, yeah. it's a disgrace. Oh. You see, I blame the judges. Oh, yeah, oh, judges, yeah. So they should be locked up, they should. <laughs> I mean, it, it's free to a cell, free to a cell, and one bucket between them. Oh, it's disgusting, eh? Yeah, it's disgusting. Well, they should use a toilet like everyone else. <laughs> And then there's the, the Lebanon's hostage crisis. Oh, yeah, well, well I wouldn't know about that, because I was shop at CNA, you see. Yeah. <laughs> I was shop at CNA. No, 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 no. Lebanon, not Debenhams. Oh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, what's, 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 all the, what's all this Lithuania business? Ah, well, it's, uh, this uh, Lithuanian, 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 well, what it is, you see, yes. it's, um, it's the Russians. Oh, I mean, yeah. you see, they've, they've cut off the oil. Oh, yeah, yeah. They've cut off the gas. Gas, yes. Well, he'll be round next week for the settee, then, won't he? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, basically, see, it all comes down to money. Oh, it, yeah. I mean, everything is money. Yeah. I mean, if you look at Bros, yeah, for instance, yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, they're not short of a few bob, are they? Bros, eh? <laughs> well, they are now. Oh, yeah. Well, they are. <laughs> I mean, 
<laughs> what do you spend all that money on, eh? That £120,000. I, I mean, I, where'd it all go? I, I don't know. Where, where'd it go, then? Well, I'll tell you. I'll tell you. Went, um, it was, was 20000 on hair. Yeah. yeah. It was uh, 40000 on clothes. Yeah, clothes, yeah. And it was uh, sixty grand on cars. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And um, uh, £2.35 and a box of Quality Street for Craig's leaving present. <laughs> But you see, I mean, all these pop groups, I mean, they get all the glamour, don't they? I mean, oh. it's, like this, it's like this new film about these two villains who uh, will go around sort of shooting people's legs off just yeah. for the hell of it. Um, Ron and... Uh, Ron and... Oh, uh, oh, oh, oh Hale and Pace, you mean? Cray Twins. Oh, the, you know, oh, the Cray Twins. Yeah, they're, they're, they're gangsters. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, you know, they're being yeah. played by those blokes out of Spandau Ballet. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's daft, isn't it? I mean, yeah. it's stupid. I mean, what, what, what do Spandau Ballet and, and, and the Cray Twins have in common, eh? Oh... They, they haven't had it in years, have they? <laughs> <laughs> what, what, what do you think of this uh, strange ways? This, uh, thing, strange ways? Yeah. Well, uh, don't know really. I shop at Tesco's. <laughs> The German people want European Economic Union. The French people want European political union. I've spent ten years getting rid of the unions. So they can sod right off. <laughs> We've built a new opera house in Paris. We're building a new parliament building in Dusseldorf. We're building a new Arndale Center in Staines. <laughs> we are learning to use the language of our European partners. We are learning to use the language of our partners in Europe. You know, if you shout loud enough, they get the message. <laughs> French is the language of love. German is the language of reason. I'm sorry, I haven't the faintest idea what you're talking about. <laughs> we sank the Bismarck. We sank HMS Hood. We sank the Rainbow Warrior. <laughs> Sorry. We sank heaven for little girls. 43,162. Q8. Uh, anyone give me 25 quid for the gavel? Mom? Mrs. Thatcher, I wonder if I could ask you about your position on the arts. Well, I'm sitting on it. Yes, under the firm guidance of Margaret Thatcher and her ministers, the arts and the theatre have continued to make us look at the human condition and ask important questions like, where's the money gone? And I'm proud to be responsible for the future of the arts in Britain. Be your Chancellor of the Exchequer. As I say, I'm proud to be responsible for the future of the arts in Britain. And what do you say to the criticisms that have been made of government funding of the arts? Well, I think they're largely irrelevant. You're saying such attacks are unjustified? No, I'm saying the arts are largely irrelevant. <laughs> and the modern repertoire reflects the challenging new climate, with plays that relate to today's audience, such as The Importance of Being Earners, <laughs> When Did You Last See Your Subsidy, <laughs> and Waiting for Gyro. Yes, everywhere actors rise to the challenge of the brave new climate. Of course, I always knew he was perfect for mm. one gentleman of Verona. Yes, well, I, I first saw him in, um, in Romans in Britain. Oh, oh yes. Oh, yes. Which one did he play? All of them. <laughs> Must have been a frightful strain. Oh. Yes, of course, I don't think he ever got over it, really, because I saw his bottom at the RSE shortly <laughs> afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> and so, everywhere, the government is supporting exciting and ambitious projects, like here at the Rose Theatre. Well, this is, this is just marvellous. I mean, this, what this set is absolutely fantastic. Um, you look along there, it's going to be 20 stories high, and I, I, think this, uh, I, I think this could be the new national... Theatre? No, car park. <laughs> <laughs> and here's an example of that far-sighted government policy. The Sainsbury's wing of the National Gallery. Yes, there's no doubt that where arts and culture are concerned, Britain is leading the way. Lot 15, an original Geoffrey Arton novel, who'll give me 15p? <laughs> Companies are just queuing up to sponsor productions of the classics. It was in the theatre that sponsorship took off, with famous productions like Look Back in Anger, sponsored by Everest Double Glazing. <laughs> Derek Jacobi's Hamlet at the Aldwych. To be or not to be, that is the question.
and most famously in Rosencrantz and Guildenstern yeah, drink Carling Black Label at the Apollo. <laughs> but did such sponsorship affect the artistic integrity of the play? Not a bit, says theatre producer Dandy Dinmont. Oh, hardly at all. I mean, audiences were falling, theatres were closing, actors found it hard to get the work. But ask about the brand cakes, that's a different matter. <laughs> And music has a special place in the culture of modern Britain. Well, I think what first attracted me to Puccini was this wonderful quality he had to his music, which made it perfectly suited to the 25-second airline commercial. <laughs> yes, as they prepare to swap their shreds of communist culture for a taste of the best of British... Do we beat you? We surely do. <laughs> ...they're getting ready for a culture shock. This is our culture, and it's shocking. <laughs> Thank you. You know, every so often people complain about bias in the programme. And they're right. I think, it's, I think it's important to be fair and attack both sides of the Conservative Party. <laughs> but look at it from our point of view. I've got all these jokes about a Conservative government and I've got to use them while we've still got one. <laughs> See, attacking the BBC has always been good fun. I mean, a few years ago it was Tony Benn saying, well, of course, the BBC is blatantly right-wing and biased towards the Conservatives. <laughs> that, of course, was the flip side of his hit record, Inchy Winchy Spider, Infiltrate the Spider. Meanwhile, Radio 4 has been suffering the attentions of the Media Monitoring Unit. What is a Media Monitoring Unit? You get sort of visions of a vast GCHQ operation, sophisticated satellite surveillance equipment. Bollocks, it's one bloke called Simon Burke with a tape recorder. That's what I call a small business. See, what the government can't accept is that people will occasionally use their freedom of speech to disagree with its policies. Must be a real bugger. So it won't be long before we get programmes like this. Good evening. Well, we've had lots of letters this week praising the BBC. But here's one I agreed with. Dear points of view, I must complain about the consistent bias on the BBC. Oh, where now, Mrs Ronson of Hull? Children's programmes, since you ask, Norman. Only yesterday on Play School, the story was riddled with blatant propaganda. The old woman who lives in a shoe was a clear incitement to swindle child benefit and evade poll tax. <laughs> Full marks, Mrs. R. took the words right out of my research. What are we to be told next? Ask Jeremy Dobson of somewhere that knows a good thing when it's voting. To join up the dots in the Communist Manifesto? Worry not, matey. The culprits are being dealt with even as we speak. <laughs> but children, what say you? Clearly, there is no intention of de de deliberately inciting poll tax avoidance in its broader concept. Blabs, Master Alan Dixon, eight four. There is dis discernible bias. That's good enough for me, Sonny. The anti-terrorist squad's on its way, and you win this week's satellite dish. You know, the BBC's coverage of the test series was so good, I felt proud to be British. Right, Mr Smith of South London. Even though I support the West Indies, I really thought that... Right, lad, you're no, gonna... Emma, no, no, get those handcuffs! <laughs> Where are you taking me? And a bon voyage to you, matey. Hi, Norman. What's the noise down there? Orders an anonymous viewer from Downing Street. The BBC no longer seems interested in reflecting the views of the minority in this country. What about those poor people who've held absolute power in Britain for the last ten years? When will they get their fair share of airtime? Well, we're working on it, Mrs T. So, if you've seen a programme you think stinks like a bunker rat of propaganda, <laughs> they're worth looking out for. Why not drop me a line? The alternative man from Auntie, the Blinkered Broadcasting Corporation, London W12, 1939. After all, we are an information station, and we pay for good stuff. <laughs> good night, Jim. There are some men in this society Who are different from the average male they do all kinds of things that normal chaps Find perverted and beyond the pale Living their lives in the shadows 
With a desire they cannot quit But they are much the same as you or I That's why I'm not ashamed to admit Some of my best friends are journalists <laughs> Though I try to keep it under my hat Some of my pals work for Rupert Murdoch And you can't get much lower than that Some of my best friends are journalists And the poor devils work for the sun And though I don't hold it against them I wouldn't let my daughter marry one <laughs> They get so desperate for a decent scoop They're prepared to pay for interviews They're fond of makeup, yes they make things up They don't give a toss for proper news <laughs> Completely obsessed about royalty Saying guys stick and Charles is green Devoting the front page to Fergie's bum And saying that Elizabeth is a queen Some of my best friends are journalists With less news than the Snoopy cartoon It is a fantasy world Where Adolf Hitler's bonking Elvis Presley on the moon Some of my best friends are journalists but quite frankly, we've all had enough So if you really want them to change their ways You ought to stop buying the stuff Minister, for you walk today, you've chosen to come back here to your hometown. And I just wonder what made you leave Grantham in 1943? Well, I stuck out at for as long as I could. <laughs> oh, this is actually where I was born. I was born up there. What, on the roof? No, no, the upstairs room. There was no hot water, no doctors, no incubators. I shall the National Health Service today. <laughs> You'll cut that bit, won't you? I see there's actually a plaque here commemorating oh, your birth. Yes. Margaret Thatcher yes. MP, the first woman Prime Minister born here, 13th of October 1925. 1925? That's just after the Archers. <laughs> well, I'm very pleased to see it's still a grocer's shop. And I was just thinking, there is impossible. No, no, what was it you were thinking? Well, it's just that when there was rationing, my father put 52 tins of corned beef underneath the floorboards and I would. Would you mind waiting here for a moment? Yes, yes, by all means. I'm not paying for them, they're mine. Would you like one, Miss Gray? Oh, thank you very much. Prime Minister, that's very kind of you, thank you. Yeah. That'll be nine pence. Um, have them sent round, please. So sad, really, isn't oh, it? Really. And I was at school with her. It was much the same then. Oh, really? There's no dress sense at all. <laughs> Hang on just a moment, if you would. Oh, well, I must say, that's very moving, Prime Minister. Would you mind me asking what you gave her? Oh, just a poll tax reminder. <laughs> <laughs> ah, the old school. Now, what do you remember about your school days? Well, I remember we had 45 to a class and two to a desk. Though for some reason, I was always the one who had a desk to myself. <laughs> Why was that? Were you not very popular? Oh, no, I was very popular. I was chalk monitor, slate monitor, milk monitor. I even had time to monitor the teachers. <laughs> Bullied at school at all? Of course not, no. We did have a, a, a school bully. I remember he made the other children cry until they gave him all their sweets. Eventually he grew out of it and became something quite respectable. A bailiff, I think. Well, was there anything ever missing from your education? Now, it's very odd you should say that because page seven was missing from my atlas. 
I never did discover where Scotland was. Oh, I'm Scottish, actually. Oh, really? Yes, yes. Uh, I'm so sorry. It was <laughs> awful. Now, of course, your father was a grocer, and you've often said that you run the country a bit like a local shop. So I wonder if your father set you a good example. Oh, yes, indeed. We were the only shop on our street with a £20 billion trade deficit. <laughs> This is a, a lovely spot. Yes, and I used to love coming here uh, to feed the birds. Uh, to the cat, mainly. <laughs> Look over there. Sheep? Yes. We went to order for those. It's a long time ago. Far too young to remember. So, sheep have had a bit of an influence on you? But oddly enough, yes. I remember uh, we had a deal with a local farmer. He gave my father a sheep every month in return for continuing membership of the Rotary Club. My mother worked wonders. We had wool for jumpers, the odd rug, and of course meals for weeks. A housewife today wouldn't know what to do with a dead sheep. I make my own foreign secretary. <laughs> Well, we've talked a great deal about the past, Prime Minister, so what about the future? Oh, I'm very optimistic about the future, very, because I like to look ahead of me. And I can assure you, I can see a clear way forward. Oh, well, <laughs> well, very nice, everyone. Well done. I think that's a wrap. Thank the call. <laughs> Now, Your Royal Highness, uh, the session can begin. So, let's talk about your childhood. Were you close to your parents? Oh, I should say so. We were just like any other family. I remember climbing onto my mother's lap and saying, Tell me a story, Your Majesty. <laughs> it was a happy childhood, yes? Oh, I should say so. I, I've always loved playing games. You know? and what sort of games did you play? Oh, usual ones. You know, one spies with one's little eye. <laughs> housey, housey. We called it palacey, palacey. <laughs> And, uh, things like sticking stickers on the back of the state lando saying, My other car's the Imperial State Coach. <laughs> you play hide and seek? Oh, yes. We used to do it on a larger scale. <laughs> Mummy and I would hide in different parts of the Commonwealth. Uh, people had to hide. <laughs> Trouble is, it never took long because some fool always left the Royal Standard flying outside. <laughs> Were you a very creative child? Oh, yes. I, I was a dab hand at Lego. <laughs> Andrew hated it. Every time he built something I didn't like, I'd write to the local authority and have the planning, <laughs> department, have the planning department pull it down. Uh, what about reading? Uh, do you fond of reading? Oh, I loved it, yes. I, I, I do remember that Father confiscated all my Enid Blyton books. Oh, I see. What, uh, too racist, they thought? Oh, no, not racist enough. <laughs> not enough slant-eyed yellow gits, he said. <laughs> So you enjoyed Noddy? Oh, I loved Noddy, yes. yes. And uh, how did you react to Big Ears? Uh, hard to say, no one ever said it to my face. <laughs> tell, me, tell me about school. Hmm? Oh, I had a dreadful time. I, my first term was, was, was awful. I, we weren't allowed any photos of our parents. I had to hide my stamp album. <laughs> Of course, the name didn't help either. I was always last in exams. By the time I'd written Charles, Philip, Arthur, George, Windsor, they didn't finish. Yes, couldn't, couldn't you have shortened it, perhaps, to, to the Prince of Wales? I should say not. Don't want every Tom, Dick and Charlotte thinking you've been named after a pub. <laughs> so, you went to a, a, a mixed school? Oh, yes, there were some poor pupils, yes. Yeah. <laughs> so, now, lastly, uh, Your Highness, I want to show you a picture here. I want you to identify that, if you wouldn't mind. That was that bloody National Gallery extension, isn't it? Perfectly correct. Yes, you're right. Um, I'm glad to tell you, Your Royal Highness, you are completely normal. It's only the rest of the world that's mad. Would you like to go out and send the next patient in, please? Yes. Uh, Miss Johnson, put that on the bill. Uh, the family have an account with us. <laughs> ah, good morning, and how are we today, Mr. Bonaparte? Very well, thank you. <laughs> Well, the theatre has always been a precarious life. Only 5% of actors are working class, and the rest wish to God they were. <laughs> but producers do try and help. Uh, when a part comes up, they see thousands of hopeful actors before casting Denham Elliott. <laughs> the competition for commercials is so fierce, last time I went to an audition, I was in a queue behind three espresso machines and a performing squirrel. <laughs> so if you want to make something mundane sound grand, you just get in a classy voice, regardless of where it'll be heard. 
Uh, right, uh, if you could just uh, read the part for us, Mr. Hurt. Uh, <clears throat> going up. <laughs> Fine, uh, could we uh, try reading for the other part? <clears throat> going down. <laughs> How was I? Uh, could we just try a teensy weensy bit in your own voice? That was my own voice. <laughs> Look, come on, love, I've done them all. Selfridges, the Army and Navy, <laughs> Benton Colliery, and, of course, the over-the-top shop. <laughs> all the time I've had my heart set on the lead male in Harrods. Haven't we all? <laughs> Welcome, sir or madam, not that it seems to matter to you. <laughs> Welcome to Harrods, punters. Yes, you'll find it more than adequate in the gentleman's department. <laughs> but how would sir like to pay? A pack of lies? That'll do nicely. <laughs> See, if British Rail ever wanted to make a station announcement comprehensible, all they have to do is to hire a Shakespearean character actor. Yes, well, my old muggers, it gives me great pleasure to announce the 745 to Bristol is now <clears throat> standing as it does on platform three and running 30 years late. <laughs> I know how it feels. Mm. <laughs> Sorry, I've tried, love. Um, what's the line? Like? London to Bristol, uh, Sir Donald. Mm. Not to worry, it's all covered in my latest volume of memoirs, A Touch of the Timetables. <laughs> <laughs> they don't always get it right, like the last time they were casting for the speaking clock. Ah, right on time, Mr Moore. <laughs> Would you, uh, <laughs> like me to read? <laughs> God, we're ten minutes late now. <laughs> In my own time? The, the planet doesn't have that long. We'll just stick to GMT, if you would. <laughs> At the third stroke, the time. Sponsored by a beep. <laughs> I, I think you cued the pips too early there. <laughs> Sorry, we've run out of time. At drama school, they told me pauses were everything. <laughs> well, in your case, Roger, they're 90% of your act. <laughs> It's all to do with warmth. I mean, who'd mind bad news from a speak your weight machine if it came from Billy Connolly? <laughs> oh, I! <laughs> Eight stone four, do you bloody think so? <laughs> <laughs> Who are you kidding? <laughs> I mean, come on. You, st <laughs> you stick to a carry out, never mind the workout. Look, how can I put this delicately? Does the word crowd mean anything to you? Thank you. Good night. Thank you.